to the church there as well. We don't need no help. We're self-sufficient. We don't need anything. We can provide for all our own needs. We have not a care in the world. Hmm. That's a recipe for becoming lukewarm and amongst being prideful and self-sufficient and all those kind of things. Amen. All right. So in verse 17, it says, Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Do you think Jesus knew what they had been saying? Do you think what the, he knew what their response to Rome was when they wanted to help them rebuild? Do you think all these things? Yeah. Jesus knew that. You know what? You've said this, and you've said this, and you've said this, and you have no idea what you actually look like. All right? So, then, verse 18 still, I counsel you to buy me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. What's the next thing he says? And white garments. Okay? So, first, we're already rich. What's he talking about? Buy of him gold refined in the fire. That we can be rich? We're already rich. I don't need no help. I do it myself, right? Okay, now next, number two, white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, okay? Hmm, guess what they did in Laodicea? They made clothing. Yeah, listen to this. So the city was a great center of, like, clothing manufacturing, Okay, and they were known or renowned, actually. What kind of garments did Jesus say to buy of me what? White garments. They were actually renowned, like world known, for this black wool material that they made. And so it was like this glossy fabric, and they would make these outer garments with it, and especially these tunics. I can't remember the name of them. Okay, and so Rome, but even other wealthy areas of the world would come to buy these tunics and things that were made because guess what? This was not a popular thing. Like, black's my favorite color, right? <laughs> I own at least five black t-shirts in my closet. Like, boom, 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 boom. Oh, no, I don't want to wear that one. That one looks almost just like it, but it's not the same. I want to wear that one, right? <laughs> black was not a thing back then. You know, we know purple royalty and all that kind of stuff and that that was expensive and all of that, Okay. But black material, this wool that was made into this soft black material that was made for these tunics and everything, it became something that only the wealthy could afford. And that Rome, it was highly sought after by Rome, okay? And so this material and these clothes that were made, all right, they were highly coveted by the wealthy. So guess how they got their money to rebuild after the earthquake? Guess how they became rich in those 43 years of history? It's because... They had this black material that they were selling all of these things, okay? Isn't this cool? Yeah. Wait till you hear the last one. It's so good. Um, and so the next one, it brings us to number three, okay? And when we finish out verse 18 there, it says, And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see, okay? Now, not only were they rich, not only did they have this black material and sell all these clothes, okay? They also were very medically astute, all right? Laodicea, in addition to being the center for clothing manufacturing, they also had this amazing medical facility and this teaching and training place, okay? And it was found in a different city just a few miles off from uh, Laodicea, and for a time it was held there. It was this temple to this other god, and the medical school was located there. But as it grew and became more renowned and everything, they needed to move it to a larger area. And so it was moved right into the city center of Laodicea. And it just became this booming, like, think of like the Ohio State University School of Medicine or something. It just became this huge medical facility. And some of their doctors were even so renowned that two of them, uh, their faces were put on coins of the money that was used in Laodicea because they were such renowned doctors. All right, and so um, in this area, you know, when it was back, this was a, a Phrygian god. I think I'm saying that right. All right, and so they would set up their city center there, and they would set up the markets, and the people would come and sell their things and all of this right in this temple to this god, okay, but they also used it for all these things. And then it gets moved to Laodicea, all right, and then these doctors were famous for producing two different kinds of medicine, and guess what they were? Yeah, 
One was like an ointment for the ears, and the other one, they had taken this stone from this city called Phrygia, and they had ground up this stone and mixed it with oil, and they made eye salve out of it. Now, how many times have we read Revelation chapter 3, verse 18? Buy of me gold, tried in the fire, and white garments, and eye salve that you may see. And we don't know because we haven't studied, right? Because it's not just written there for us. We actually have to dig for it, okay? And we haven't studied to know what. And the whole time, Laodicea is rich, and they make garments, which happen to be black instead of white, and they're known for two specialized medicines that people from all over the world come to get because they actually work, okay? And one is an ear ointment. And one is an eye salve. And I'm just sitting there like, God, you're so good. That's cool. Like, oh, my goodness, my little dogs just look like I was the only one home. Isaac's in school now. Chris is at work. And I'm like, you're so cool. And Murphy's like, who are you talking to, (laughs) right? But, oh, my gosh, and what do we miss if we don't study these things out? But how many of us, let's be truthful, have been like, Bible study, like Bible reading is hard enough. I don't want to like study, like get out an extra book and put it on the table or have more than like four tabs open on the computer to like study. Like who wants to study something? I'm not in school anymore, right? But look at what we miss and look at all the exciting stuff there is to find if we actually do start digging around for things, right? Like, ah, that's so good. And so, yeah. So they make eye salve, right? And it's really cool. There's my little dude. Hi, Isaac. So these town doctors become famous. Their faces are on these coins. They make this eye salve. These people come around from everywhere, from all around the world. They travel to Laodicea so that they can get this ear ointment and so they can get this eye salve because they needed it. And they were rich, and therefore they were self-sufficient, and they were famous for making this black clothing, and they were medically proficient to where they were world-renowned for making this eye salve. And all the time, Jesus is saying all of these opposite things to them, right? Like, what? You think you're this. You think you're all that. And actually, this is what you are. You're wretched, and you're miserable, and you're poor. Oh, that one got him. And you're blind, and you're naked. No, we're not. We're the finest dressed, and we got the best medicine, and we don't need no help from you. Hmm. And that's in addition to being lukewarm. We just think lukewarm's the worst part of it, right? Because, oh, the lukewarm church, oh, oh. We think that's the worst part, and we don't think of all the rest because we don't know, because we don't dig in there, and we don't find it out, Right? And so the, take, the takeaway from all this is that Christ tells them that they actually are lukewarm. And he tells them that they're all these things. And he tells them that they need to buy of him gold refined in the fire. Okay? And how many of us have read this before? We've read this, haven't we? Yeah, buy of me gold refined in the fire and white garments. And we're like, yeah, we're going to be dressed in white. We're going to have linen robes and... We all know big robes hide a multitude of sin, and so we're all going to look great. And and I'm going, God, I don't wear dresses. Do I have to wear a big robe in heaven? (laughs) But we've read all these things before, and we've teased about them, and we've joked about them. And, oh, am I going to be a size this in heaven? Well, I don't know. I don't think so, because it says we're going to be known as we were on earth. So, And I'm like, oh, me? (laughs) like how else are they going to recognize me unless I look like myself and just all this stuff right and we joke about all of these things okay and we've read all these things before we know them we've seen them oh yeah 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 gold refined in the fire I've read that oh yeah lukewarm yeah I've read that before okay now according to verse 19 everything that had been said prior to verse 19 everything we just read right He says there that it's a a rebuke and a chastening that has come from him. And they want us to hear this, okay? It's imperative that we see what he says there. He says in verse 19 that it's a rebuke and a chastening. But guess what he says right before that? He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. What? I've told you guys before, my mom, she was not afraid to paddle me. 
for every single thing that could have possibly deserved a whooping. And she would tell me, I do this because I love you. And I used to yell back, if you love me, stop hitting me. (laughs) And it didn't work, and I probably got a few extra ones for that, right? But what does Jesus say there? Because I love you. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Huh. And then he says, therefore, be zealous and repent. Now, this is why I titled this message tonight, A Lecture of Love, Lessons from a Lukewarm Laodicea. I didn't call it a lesson of rebuke. That's what he's doing. He's rebuking them. But it's not a lesson of rebuke. It's a lesson of love. Because as many as he loves, he rebukes and chastens. I love my children. Therefore, if I see them going in the wrong direction, I'm going to snatch them up to have them I just said snatch them up. I did. To have them go the other way. What if Isaac ran out of here and went to run into the road? Would I go, oh, I don't want him to think I would ever yell at him. I'm just going to see what happens. No. I'm going to let him play Frogger in the street because I don't want him to think that I don't love him because I'm going to yell at him. No. What am I going to do? I love him. Therefore, I'm going to pull him from traffic, okay? I'm going to rebuke him. I'm going to chasten him. I'm going to say, you ought to know better. I taught you better. Because I love you, I'm going to whoop you right now. (laughs) Okay? But what's Jesus say? Because I love you, right? Now repent and turn from your ways and go that way instead, right? But what does Jesus say? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent, okay? This is a lecture of love that he's giving, He's not giving a lecture of rebuke here. He's telling them these things about themselves because he loves them and he has better for them and he wants them to walk in better and he knows the path that they're on and where it's going to lead and he's trying to draw them back to himself and that's what love does. That's what the cross does. That's what our Savior does. He shows us the error of our ways to draw us back to himself because he loves us. Do we see this, okay? And so in these first chapters of Revelation, these are all churches, aren't they? He's speaking to the seven churches, and Laodicea is a church here. He's writing to the church, and chapter 1 describes, okay, this beginning of this vision that John saw, all right? And he turned to see this voice that he's hearing. All of a sudden, he says, I was caught up in the Spirit. It was the Lord's day, and I heard this voice. And as I heard this voice, I turned to see who it was that was speaking. And when I did, right, and then it takes us all through Revelation chapter 1, Starting in verse 13, it says, In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded with a chest with a golden band, his head and hair were white as wool his, and as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand the seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and in his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Wow, that's just at the beginning. That's in chapter 1. He hasn't even really seen anything yet, and he already fell as dead. And Jesus had to pick him up and say, no, it's okay. I have a lot of stuff to tell you. You need to pay attention. (laughs) Get up. Okay? But what did he have? He has the seven stars in his hand, but he's walking amongst. Verse 20 says, these golden lampstands. Verse 20 describes that the golden lampstands he sees, there's seven of them. Those are the seven churches. The seven stars are the spirits of the seven churches, right? To the angel of the church of Laodicea, right? Okay, these are the stars. The churches themselves are these golden lampstands. They are churches. And what is Jesus doing? John sees him walking amongst the churches. Wow. And as he's walking amongst the churches, he's seeing all of these things. The lukewarm church, the church that lost its first love. The church. He's seeing these things as he's walking amongst the churches. 
I told you that when you guys were praising, I was praying. One of the things I was praying was, God, just as you walked, Jesus, just as you walked amongst those churches in the Revelation of John, walk amongst our church. Reveal to us the things in us that aren't like you. Draw us back to you just like you did the church of Laodicea. Show us the things in us that aren't like you. Show us the things that we think we got it all figured out and we think we're doing everything right. But when you walk amongst us, you see that we're wretched and we're miserable and we're poor and we're blind and we're naked. And God, give us that refiner's fire and put something in us that shows us the error of our way. Just as you walked amongst the churches then, walk amongst our church today. Walk up and down the aisles. Walk from seat to seat to seat. What do you see? Reveal to us what you see. So he's speaking to churches here, and that's what I want to get across to us because we take the next scripture out of context all the time. There's famous pictures that are made of it. There's famous sayings about it. There's writings about it. And all of it is out of context because we always say that he's speaking to the unsaved here. And he's not. He's speaking to the church. Verse 19, we'll start there. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. At the church door. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. He says he's standing at the door and he's knocking and he is waiting to be let in. How many churches have their doors open every Sunday morning and Jesus ain't allowed to show up? And the Holy Spirit isn't allowed to move. And he better not come walking up and down the aisles and messing up our program and what we have planned. And he's going, I'm standing out here knocking. And you got my name above your doorpost. But I'm not in there and you won't let me in. Wow. This is not to the unsaved. He's not standing outside their door knocking. No. The Holy Spirit draws them and woos them and speaks to their hearts. Jesus is talking to the church here. He's talking to the lukewarm church here. He's talking to, if you believe, in the duality of Scripture and this dispensationalism that's represented here. He's talking to the end times church here. And he's saying, I'm standing outside of the door and I'm knocking. And if you'd just answer it, I'd come in. If you'd just answer it, I'd come dine with you. If you'd just answer it, I'd come in and fellowship with you. I'd come in and commune with you. I'd come in and walk amongst you. I'd come in and show you what things need worked on. I'd come in and do a great work in you. I'd come in and make it to where you could see, and I'd make it to where you could hear, and I'd make you ready for that day when I'm coming. Wow. Think about it. But I'm standing out here knocking. Are you going to open the door? Wow. Wow. Think of Pastor Jerry on Sunday morning. What was he talking about? He was talking about the difference between conviction, right, and condemnation. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he says, this isn't about condemnation, and we're getting ready to take communion, right? He's saying, but if you feel conviction, that means there's something in you that Holy Spirit's working on. This is the time. It says examine yourself in the word of God. And so Holy Spirit starts to reveal something to you that doesn't line up, okay? And you feel convicted about that. That's not a bad thing. It means he loves you, okay? But conviction and conversion are two different things. So you can walk out of that door convicted and be exactly the same as when you walked in. You just felt bad while you were here. That ain't why he does it. He does it to show you what's in your life that doesn't quite look like him. Remember the onions and the layers of the, like, we're like ogres. Do you remember that? He's showing you another layer that needs worked on. So as you're standing there with your little nasty, I'm sorry, it tastes so gross, the little nasty wine cup thing, okay, that's representative of his blood and his body, right? And you're trying to like, and you're shaking because the Holy Spirit's moving and you're trying to open the little thing and you're trying to examine yourself and you're going, oh, Why'd you just bring that to my mind? Oh, I don't want to see that. No, God, this is just time for us to commune together. And he says, I am communing with you. 
I'm letting you know something in your life that needs worked on right now so that you can stand pure and ready before me. As you do this in remembrance of me, remember what it was for. It was for the cleansing of you. And there's something in you that needs cleansed right now, so I'm showing that to you. And that's what he's saying here. Be zealous and repent. Why? Because I'm standing out here knocking, and I want to come in and commune with you. I want to have communion with you. I want to do this with you. And what's he say in verse 21? Hmm. He gives the most beautiful promise to all the ones who will listen to his voice. He says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So I want you to remember this, this tonight. Music team, you can come up if you'd like is that he works on you in an area, right? Just like a layer of the onion, okay? He works on you in this area. And if he speaks to your life in this certain instance, okay? Or if Holy Spirit kind of puts his finger on an area that needs some refining, right? That's what we're going to go into next week is the refiner's fire. And so it doesn't mean that you're all out like 